I'm Justin Bassey, the Executive Director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Let me welcome you all to the business component of Rosina at Sydney. The first Rosina in Australia, and hopefully the first of many. I thank uh, Minister Jaishanka and his team, as well as Samir Saran and his team at the Observer Research Foundation, uh, and of course my own colleagues. Together we've shown the ambition uh, to make this event a reality. I thank the Indian Government and the Ministry of External Affairs, and also the Australian Government, specifically Assistant Minister of Trade and Assistant Minister of Manufacturing, Tim Ayres, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for their support. A big thanks also to Jody McKay, National Chair of the Australia India Business Council, and to Google and their Vice President, Michaela Browning, one of the heads of Asia Pacific, uh, and uh, as I'm sure you'll know uh, through the day, a, a huge advocate of the Quad. McKay has come all the way from Singapore actually for uh, to part of this event, which is great. This room is full of dignitaries and senior executives, so uh, I don't take up the entire business breakfast uh, if I went through everybody, but I would like to acknowledge Indian High Commissioner Manpreet Gora. Thank you for being here, and the entire Indian delegation for coming all this way. It's also great to see Swapi Dame, who has just taken on the role of Chair of the Centre for Australia India Relations. I wish you, Swapi, the very best for what is a really key role. I want to emphasise the importance that we place on this business element of Rosina at Sydney. Governments tend to engage easily and automatically with counterpart governments, but it's never been more important for governments to exchange views with the private sector. We live in a digital age in which technology, mostly private sector created and operated, is central to every aspect of our lives and instrumental to our economic security. That economic security depends on governments working with industry and civil society. And while we have been perhaps a little slow over the years to appreciate the importance of the Australia-India relationship, we all now recognise that there are few more important partnerships than that between Australia and India. We share the pragmatic, practical aim of driving our economic development and technological advancement while maintaining our respective security and sovereignty. Our partnership is vital not just for our two countries, but for our entire region. It is an absolute keystone for stability from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific, which is why increased engagement and collaboration, such as the conversations we're having here today, are crucial as India prepares to host G20 and Australia hosts the Quad Leaders. Our conversations this year will help shape our region for the better in the decades ahead. With that, it is my absolute pleasure to ask Assistant Minister Ayres to provide opening remarks and formally introduce External Affairs Minister Chai Shanka. Well, good morning. It's a um, total delight uh, to be here, even on a Saturday morning. It's, uh, it's very, very good to see you all. Uh, what, a, what, what, what an important um, event this is. Seen a dialogue in uh, in Sydney. Um, what a coup to um, for this uh, first time in Sydney to have uh, His Excellency the uh, Indian Minister for External Affairs, uh, Dr. Jaishankar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this event has been held, the Gadigal people. First Nations connections to this country stretched back 65,000 years. Um, the, oldest, the oldest continuous culture on earth. It is, um, it is uh, a very important, um, put aside the, the history and culture and the challenges that um, Australia, like many countries around the world, has in reckoning with its own history and own culture. But what a, what a, what a marvellous asset for Australia. 65,000 years of continuous culture. Pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, I want to thank uh, ASPE and the Observer Research Foundation for their invitation and for their valuable contributions to our thinking on strategic policy in Australia, uh, in India uh, and globally. I, I was saying to Justin this morning, you, you know, amongst the many contributions that ASPE has made, uh, uh, getting Australian policymakers to 
think about uh, industry capability uh, and sovereign capability in a new way has been a, a really a five-year achievement. Um, and ASPE has played a critical role in that, taking Australian policymakers beyond the old orthodoxy that, um, that an open market approach to uh, trade, uh, a, a, an open market approach to our economy, and a strong industry policy approach are incompatible policy objectives. Um, it's not, uh, not an approach that many of our friends around the world, uh, including our friends in India, uh, have struggled with, but in Australia, policymakers saw these as irreconcilable, and, and ASPE has played, I think, a very important role uh, in breaking that down. So there, there is a new determination uh, from the new Albanese government to rebuild industrial capability. There is equally a determination to maintain our commitments to open markets, uh, to a global trading regime that's based on rules, and to not, uh, in this very challenging period, revert to protectionism, uh, because that would be uh, a disaster for the Australian economy uh, as well. So that's the challenge that's in front of us. Um, I, it, it is a real honour to be able to introduce uh, India's Minister for External Affairs, uh, Dr Jaishankar, who's a frequent and very welcome visitor to these shores. Um, he is um, a, uh, a, a rare thing in international affairs, a, in, uh, in, for democratic nations, a, a foreign minister who is a foreign affair, has been a foreign affairs practitioner his whole life. Um, a, uh, we have our soldier scholars, uh, and he is our, our uh, foreign affairs scholar who's made a big contribution in his own, in, in, in his own right prior to his political career. Uh, in international relations. And I know Prime Minister Albanese and a series of other senior ministers are looking forward to, uh, to their meetings with you today and that they place uh, great importance uh, on today's discussions. And later this year, of course, Australia is looking forward to hosting the Quad Leaders meetings and to India's uh, leadership role hosting the G20 meetings uh, in September. Um, Dr Joshenka, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Albanese government has a deep regard for our relationship with India. It's one of the great democracies of the world. Uh, and of course, the largest democracy in the world. Of course, last year, we celebrated 75 years of Indian independence. And in fact, uh, there were celebrations with thousands of people engaged uh, across Australia in the 75 year uh, Independence Day celebrations. And they were very colourful, vibrant, uh, uh, events uh, indeed. The relationship between Australia and India is enduring and it is deep. It spans oceans and, industry and, and industries. It has enriched Australia's culture as well as our economy and it makes us a stronger and better place. The Indian diaspora in Australia is a core part of Australia's multicultural makeup. Almost a million people in Australia claim Indian heritage. In last year's budget, the government made a substantive investment to advance Australia's strategic and economic cooperation with India. Our joint programs and initiatives include funding research collaborations in science, uh, in science and technology, strengthening critical mineral supply chains and projects, and promoting our creative and cultural industries. And we're working together to build the peace, prosperity and stability of our region through groupings like the Quad, and within structures like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. There is, very, there is a lot to look forward to uh, in the Australia-India relationship. The Australia-India Economic Cooperation Trade Agreement, IACTA, entered into force at the end of last year. Uh, despite, despite some predictions, I have to say, that it, that it would um, struggle to make its way through our, uh, through our respective systems, um, some unhelpful predictions made by, I saw by a colleague of uh, a colleague of mine who just lost government. Um, it, it sailed through the parliament. It sailed through the parliament because because everybody in the parliament, um, everybody in the government understands how important uh, this relationship is. As the world's fastest growing major economy, India offers vast opportunities for Australian jobs and economic prosperity and for joint industrial, technological 
and energy collaboration and cooperation. So we're eager as a government to build on the strong foundations laid by ECTA by negotiating uh, the next round, uh, comprehensive round of uh, that important trading agreement. As our Minister for Trade, Don Farrell, has written, the Australian government sees significant potential for greater exchange of ideas and talent as our people-to-people -people links grow. Uh, I'm so pleased uh, to see all of these business leaders uh, here today, you know, to work through how we operationalise and make practical uh, this cooperation. I'm also pleased to see so many talented Indian students have returned to Australia after the pandemic. You know, we, we uh, sometimes in our press we see uh, uh, the debate about international students is a little narrow. It's seen as an industry, a sector where um, where students are counted as uh, as um, uh, items on our sort of export and uh, import uh, balance sheet. Truth is, <coughs> educating students here in Australia is uh, one of the things that we're proudest of. Uh, we see it as a solemn contract between us and the parents. I always call them kids. I mean, they're mostly postgraduate students, but I see them as kids because I'm so old. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solemn undertaking to look after young people at this formative stage of their lives, and we take that very seriously and it's a delight to see international students, particularly Indian international students, returning to Australia in such great numbers. To make the most of the talents and energy of the Indian Australia community, the government has established a new centre for Australia-India relations right here in New South Wales. And I'm very pleased to acknowledge the presence of Swathi Dave uh, today. Ms Dave, um, who, who I've known for many years, um, was most recently the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Export Finance Australia, which is our key uh, overseas financing bank, and was last week, uh, the announcement was made that she's been appointed the inaugural chair of the advisory board for the centre. It's a very fine appointment, so I think we really look forward to working with you in this role. Um, I look forward to working with the centre to increase Australian businesses, India literacy, support two-way policy dialogues uh, and maintain a range of Australia-India Matre friendship programs. We, we are deeply committed to the relationship. Uh, and it's good to see uh, Michaela Browning here uh, from Google, Jody McKay from the Australia-India Business Council. It's, it's, uh, it's an extraordinary development really. Um, Jody and Swathi, both, uh, who I've both known for a very long time, both arriving in these critical roles it's in, in, in the Australia-India relationship, it's a very good sign, I think, for the future of this relationship. Um, I, um, I just say at, at the end, this, this relationship, in my view, is vital for our national interests, for our regional security, for our prosperity, for the, uh, for the, for the future of both of our peoples. Um, it is, a, it is an absolute delight, Minister, to introduce you um, uh, to this group. Uh, Dr Jashankar is an exceptional thinker and scholar in the foreign policy uh, space. I know that this audience is very much looking forward to hearing from him and, uh, and we are very honoured uh, to have you uh, in this fine city on what is going to be a very, very hot day. Thank you. <laughs> Well, a very good morning. It's not that early, but uh, uh, but it's really wonderful to be back here. And uh, I think uh, Justin and Samir, I need to thank you both for for making this event possible. Senator, thank you very much for your warm words. Uh, what I thought would be the most useful thing that I could do uh, for all of you is really speak a little bit about how we see the relationship but more important, perhaps share with you uh, how I see, you know, the Indian landscape changing and, you know, why that is relevant for you. And uh, when I say I see the Indian landscape changing, in a way I bring multiple perspectives to bear, uh, 
the objectivity of someone who spent a lot of time outside his own country, who keeps looking back at it, and who, who in a way is a sort of marketing department of the country for 40 years. So, so you have to know your product well to, you know, to market it effectively outside. And then uh, a brief corporate education, which uh, uh, was, you know, very, very useful, uh, very brief, unfortunately. Uh, and four years as a practicing politician, and believe me, the speed of education there is even faster. Uh, and really, when you go around, I, I, I would say, uh, to me, the, the real discovery of being a politician is how much time you spend uh, really on the on the road i mean on on the street uh, and and the kind of things you pick up there and uh, uh, the impact of changes which uh, otherwise you you look at it much more theoretically if you are just living in a capital city but let me kind of dial back a bit come you know uh, look at the relationship itself and i think uh, i i would very much echo what the senator said which is uh, today's world, uh, I think the state of the world creates a very compelling case for India and Australia to do more with each other. For quite a few years now, for more than a decade, uh, I think we can see the, the, the direction the world is going in. Uh, uh, it's, it's in transition now, that's a, that's a very nice word which pretty much describes anything at any time. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, uh, the, the sense of stability, the factors of permanence in our calculation that we had for many decades uh, have in the last decade, you know, there have been question marks and there have been question marks. I mean, we can debate it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's happening. Uh, and it's necessary for countries like India and Australia here to work more closely to shape the direction in which the world is going. But there's a much more immediate context, and the context is especially that of the last three years. Uh, there was already this transition going on, uh, and uh, there were, there were uh, I think, uh, trade concerns, uh, there were financial concerns, and then came the COVID. Uh, and uh, the impact of the COVID has been devastating uh, on the world economy. Perhaps we in India and Australia feel it much less. As someone who travels a fair amount to other parts of the world, you know, when I, when I, we, we look at Africa and Central America and, uh, you know, some other parts of Asia, I look at my own neighborhood, you know, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, we can see really how much damage, economic damage, social damage, psychological damage uh, the COVID has done. Uh, and then, if that wasn't enough, there came the Ukraine conflict. Uh, so today, uh, I would actually, in, in terms of foreign policy, uh, for me, one of the big goals would really be uh, how do you de-risk the global economy? And you de-risk the global economy, uh, one, by building more reliable and resilient supply chains which is exactly one of the initiatives that India and Australia and Japan uh, have uh, embarked on. Two, how do we address the challenges of the digital world uh, much more uh, securely, much more credibly? Um, uh, and there, you know, that, that's a whole new set of issues and a set of policies out there, which have, uh, uh, you know, there, it's not without its geopolitical uh, aspects. Uh, and the third, of course, what are the important relationships which can, which can serve as stabilizers, uh, really, for, for, a, uh, for a sort of world economy heading into choppy waters for quite a few years ahead. Now, uh, what we are going to see, I think, on the bilateral front, hopefully, is uh, 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 your senator referred to the uh, passage of the ECTA, uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, in a larger sense, there's the comprehensive strategic partnership, which which uh, sort of uh, sets the narrative, uh, the framework really for the relationship, and how to take it forward. 
uh, I think it's hugely helpful uh, to have high-level contacts, to have uh, CEO forums, to have trade ministers. So in the coming days and weeks, uh, I expect to see a lot of activity on that front. Uh, and I think it's really when business meets business, when prime ministers meet prime ministers, when trade ministers meet, and even foreign ministers have their role. Uh, when we all do our business uh, in, a, in a much more regular, intensive, constructive manner, I think that's hugely helpful uh, to taking the relationship forward. Now, if I can switch track and speak a little bit about how I see the landscape uh, today in India. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, you know, this annual budget exercise. Uh, I'm sure you have your version of it as well. Uh, and what the budget exercise does is it's, it's like a public stock taking uh, of the national economy. Uh, and not just a, I mean, we call it budget, but actually the budget has a, alongside it uh, a, a kind of a, a, an economic, uh, shall I say, uh, uh, an economic strategy and an economic prognosis uh, for a much longer period than just the year which the, which the budget covers. So they, they come as a package. The budget, of course, course corrects every year uh, in, for that larger picture. Now, since we're just coming out of the parliament session last week uh, of the, of the, after the presentation of the budget, uh, I would uh, sort of underline to you today that in India we feel that we, relatively speaking, we have come out of the COVID challenge uh, quite strongly. I mean, there's a human cost. Uh, all of us know that. I think there's not a single family that I know which hasn't had some kind of COVID loss. Uh, and, uh, uh, but having said that, uh, the COVID period uh, one, we responded to it in a way in which uh, it was fiscally sustainable. In fact, a lot of reforms were carried out uh, during the, under the COVID stress. There was a lot of creativity, which also uh, uh, was implemented on scale on the field, also because of the COVID uh, pressures. Uh, and uh, in many ways, I think, uh, decisions which may have otherwise taken us much longer. Uh, for example, ramping up our health, uh, uh, you know, our, the resources we devote to health. I think a lot of these decisions really got fast forwarded. So the sense today in India uh, really is uh, uh, of a certain amount of economic confidence. Uh, uh, a confidence also in our ability to, uh, to manufacture, to create, uh, to collaborate in many more areas. Uh, we are targeting 7% growth uh, this year, uh, but we do expect it to improve uh, in, in, uh, the next five, over the next five years. And definitely we think we would stay uh, in that 7 to 9% range uh, at least for a decade, decade and a half. Uh, and, uh, uh, you can, in India today, see that reflected in the investment climate, uh, in the, both in the flow of uh, FDI, FII, as well as in the investments which the government itself uh, is leading, uh, the, the uh, capital uh, uh, outlay in the budget this year is actually about a third more than it's ever been before. Uh, now, uh, having sort of made that point that you're really looking at, at a uh, uh, sort of bullish uh, economic uh, scenario uh, in India. Uh, there are a few aspects which I would like to keep right at the end of the discussion because I, I think it might be uh, useful to dilate upon it at some length. But if I were to today move back to our relationship, I mentioned the investment climate because I think if there's one area in our relationship we need to look at more strongly, uh, that is really an encouraging more in investment side. I think uh, the ECTA would definitely, uh, is already having a, a good impact on trade. Uh, but if, you know, in a sense we have to walk on both legs trade and investment together because they are, uh, they are mutually reinforcing. Uh, 
Uh, so for us, when uh, you know the CEO forum meets and when the trade minister comes and when the prime minister comes, uh, how do we actually uh, uh, encourage greater investments? Uh, that is very much a focus uh, uh, for, for uh, this visit. Uh, in our own uh, relationship, I think the, the mobility migration aspect of it is, is very important. Uh, uh, we've seen a very substantial uh, uh, movement uh, of uh, Indian talent to Australia. Uh, we have roughly in the world, roughly uh, about a million students. Uh, and uh, Australia would, is I think purely, uh, probably I think third or third, probably a fourth in terms of the, uh, of the numbers. But uh, again, I agree with you. I, I, you know, you said it shouldn't be thought of as a, as a business. You didn't use those words, but that's what you meant. Uh, but, and you spoke about the, the you know, the, the trust side of it, the responsibility side of it. But I would like to also stress the strategic side of it. Uh, because what we are going to see in the world, we are already seeing in the world, is there's today a, a great mismatch between the geographies of demand and the geographies of demographics. So where the people need to be is not where the people are, or where the demand is is not where the people are. And the last year actually has seen a number of countries actually wake up to this possibility. Uh, just over the last three months, uh, I've signed a migration mobility agreement with Germany, uh, which actually has been a very conservative uh, uh, society in terms of uh, uh, flow of uh, people from outside. An even more conservative partner, Austria, uh, we have concluded an agreement for uh, a certain set of professions with Japan. Uh, it's, it's been on hold because of COVID for implementation reasons, because we also have to teach them language. Uh, with the UK, uh, with France, with Denmark, with Portugal. Uh, so uh, one part of the movement of students, you know, the education is something bigger than education. It's actually about the talent and skills which is needed to sustain a global economy. But there's the other part which today, again, we would like to focus on. It's something which uh, uh, Prime Minister Albanese, in fact, brought up in his first meeting with Prime Minister Modi when they met in Tokyo, which is how do we uh, expand in India the, the ability to impart skills uh, and uh, education. Uh, and we would very much welcome uh, Australian universities uh, in India to do that because uh, having people move out physically, we are actually not, I mean, we are talking 100,000 people. Frankly, that number is very small compared to what the global demand is. So uh, if we are really going to add a few zeros to that, uh, we need to really uh, get our, you know, uh, act together in India, do it very differently. And we can only do that if it is actually done as a global collaboration. And that's why our new eco uh, education policy uh, envisages uh, uh, a regime which will allow uh, in India uh, for foreign universities to come in in some form. Uh, I, my expectation is that there probably will be some further legislation on this subject and uh, uh, some regulations uh, which would uh, facilitate uh, that. But uh, the, the whole domain of skills and talent is something I think which is very central to this relationship. And for us, it's not just about Indian students coming to Australia. It's about India and Australia working together in India to produce, uh, you know, more, uh, more skilled, more competent uh, talent uh, for the entire world. Uh, connectivity is another uh, subject. I mean, uh, it's, it's again uh, 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 part of growing a relationship is really having the ability to move. Uh, we, we have an open skies agreement, but it's very clear again that uh, the, the supply lags well behind demand. But of course, the good news is that Air India has bought 470 planes. So hopefully uh, that should 
make a big difference uh, to connecting India uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, prosperity in India is also something I would highlight. And I, I say this uh, coming out of, you know, I've recently been to, and this is completely coincidence, to places where actually tourists go. Fiji, Cyprus, Greece, all this was work, okay, I mean, let's not, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I put it to you that just as we saw in other parts of Asia, uh, what we saw with Japan, what we saw with Korea, with Southeast Asia, China, uh, as there is greater prosperity and as the middle class grows, uh, you know, middle class is a very broad term, but in our own system. Today, uh, we would say somewhere between a quarter of India, you know, roughly, give or take, uh, would, be, would qualify uh, for what we would call middle class. But we expect this to actually uh, become uh, something like uh, six, you know, two thirds of the country in the next 25 years. And when you have that kind of growth of middle class and the, the, the consumption patterns of the middle class and the aspirations of the middle class, uh, I think it's, it's something which uh, any, you know, any producer of any goods and services which relate to middle class demand should be uh, looking at. And you know, the, the, the countries which, which clearly are early movers here uh, would draw uh, uh, a lot of benefit. Uh, another subject, of course, which has been getting a lot of attention is climate action. Uh, and again, if, if you want to see you know, big things done on scale, serious things done on scale, uh, India is in many ways the place to be. Uh, a lot of the story of the last seven, eight years has been about solar. Uh, I think you're going to see a big spike in wind uh, and obviously in hybrid uh, energy. Uh, or the, but uh, there is now uh, I think a growing focus on green hydrogen, green hydrogen, green ammonia. And uh, again, uh, this is a global phenomena. I think one of the unintended fallouts of the Ukraine conflict is uh, a de-risking from f uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so uh, green hydrogen actually probably has got a great boost uh, because of the uncertainties uh, of how uh, pipelines and uh, uh, production contracts uh, have been uh, leveraged. Now, uh, I'd just like to uh, conclude by highlighting four, four developments in India, which I think today are very important uh, to understand uh, because they capture the change uh, in a way. One that uh, we have, uh, you know, we use this term, make in India. Uh, Make, make in India uh, is a term uh, which is really meant to highlight the importance of, uh, of setting up production, of, of collaborating with Indian companies. It is not autarkic. It is collaborative. You know, we want our partners to come, but we would like them to make in India because we believe we offer a lot of uh, advantages there. And uh, the uh, the make in India in many ways is today given a practical shape through uh, in, in many domains through what we call production linked incentives. So a very, very uh, notable example is the decision by Apple uh, over the last two years uh, to shift a lot of their uh, production uh, to India. Uh, but in different domains we really want uh, global manufacturing to look at India uh, seriously. The second is, in a way, an invented in India, that you are going to see more products, more services, more technologies, uh, which are going to come out of India. Uh, and uh, if I were to, I mean, one example was even during the COVID, uh, the, the fact that uh, there was, among the vaccines which came out was a vaccine which was invented, well, more than one vaccine which was invented in India. Uh, but uh, here, uh, if I were to pick an example, I think you will get uh, really a deployable 5G technology uh, coming out of India this year. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly, I think, given what I said about trust and transparency in the digital domain, 
uh, I think this is something which will be of uh, great global interest. The third pertains to a long-standing problem we have, uh, a complaint which, about our infrastructure. Uh, and uh, again, if you come to India today, physically you can see the infrastructure position change. I mean, you travel in India, go to any Indian city, there's some building going on, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a sort of uh, an energy and, a, and a, actually a, uh, it's like, uh, you know, uh, worker bees uh, at it uh, all the time. And uh, here the, the change has been uh, an integrated infrastructure policy. Now, you might think that's not a big deal, but for us, frankly, uh, one of the reasons why we had not done well on infrastructure was it was done in a very siloed manner. So the railway guys did their stuff, the roads did theirs, the power guys did theirs. So today the idea that there's a kind of a master plan, you can say, of doing it in a, in a consolidated, collaborative, inter-departmental, inter-ministry, cross-business way, it's something we call Gati Shakti, and that's having, uh, it's, it's actually making infrastructure uh, building because, uh, you know, these are, uh, these are uh, some of the challenges are, you know, anybody who's lived in India will understand, you know, right of way, for example, getting, getting the, the land acquisition done on time. These are the kind of holdups which we've long had, and that's being addressed uh, very effectively. And lastly, uh, if there's a big change in India in the last three years, it's the digitization of India. And digitization on a scale and an intensity which is very difficult to communicate if you haven't seen it uh, for yourself. And uh, again, if I were to sort of give you a few shorthand descriptions, uh, during COVID, uh, one of our, you know, we were one of the early countries to lock down but we were one of the countries who locked down most comprehensively. When we locked down, we completely locked down. And the challenge was how do you feed, you know, what happens to people in the informal economy, uh, people who went back to their homes during this period. Uh, so it was, it was a socio-economic challenge, to some degree it was a political challenge. And it was actually the time when the digital backbone was tested. And we had these two programs, uh, one of uh, giving uh, free food, uh, and for till this 31st of December last year, uh, beginning from May of 2020, uh, we were actually delivering uh, free food to a little more than 800 million people. And 800 million people, confident that it was actually going to them, unlike Earlier days, it wasn't that it was getting siphoned off, coming into the market, middlemen were taking stuff. The digital was actually ensuring an integrity of delivery and transaction that would not have been possible. Uh, equally, on the financial side, uh, because we had encouraged people to open bank accounts, sometimes bank accounts with no money in them, but we were, again, during the same period, uh, putting in money into uh, the bank accounts of 415 million people who are the lowest income uh, in the country. And if you ask me, how did you get through COVID? I cannot overstate the importance of actually financially supporting people and feeding people and ensuring that this works on the ground. But it's not just the crisis interventions which are a validation. This has now become the basic governance uh, mechanism today uh, to do uh, socio-economic delivery. So if you look, uh, we, are, we are trying to demonstrate that we can construct a social, a comprehensive social welfare system, even at our scale of income. And our scale of income is $2,000 per capita. And we can do that, really, by, you know, really cutting the overheads, making sure that the, in a, in a sense that the programs are very targeted and therefore very, very efficient. So uh, if you look at most uh, of our, uh, of our uh, uh, delivery programs today, uh, the, the social programs, we have really in the last four years been able to get about 500 million people covered by health schemes. 
about the same number covered by pension schemes. Uh, the, you know, there was a, there was a, uh, a program to replace firewood with uh, cooking gas. Uh, and uh, the cooking gas, uh, initial lot of cooking gas, you get free of cost. Now, that program was as big as 80 million people. Uh, we have a housing program. Uh, a housing program, we've already delivered 30 million houses. And at five people, a family in India, that means 150 million people have been covered. So I'm giving you these numbers because it actually tells you the scale which digital backbone makes possible. We couldn't have done this 10 years ago because we didn't have that backbone and we didn't have the strategic understanding to, to activate and utilize that backbone. Uh, and you can see this in the lifestyle of people as well. I mean, today, uh, if you look at education, uh, so much of it today is, is digital. Look at shopping. I mean, we have, the, the, in fact, if you look at our, uh, our cashless transactions, the uh, UPI, uh, I think we record the largest number of cash test transactions in the world. So there's been a kind of a, a technology leapfrogging in the, in the uh, psyche of people. And that's been actually a very, very uh, big uh, difference. And it's having, you know, as a, as a political person, uh, I can tell you, you know, when you go to your constituency, you go to other constituencies, you're campaigning. This is really what is making uh, a difference. That, uh, when, you know, there are people who, and, and the, the nice thing about it, this is actually absolutely faceless. So it relieves the politician of any charge of favoring, you know, one group or one community or one region uh, against the other. I mean, you, you actually can go in there completely objective, utterly impartial, totally technology data driven. Uh, and that's, you know, that's an enormous boom. So these were some of the, you know, uh, thoughts which I thought, uh, you know, I, I should uh, uh, share with you. Uh, the, uh, you know, my sense is we today clearly got uh, a strong political tailwind. Uh, uh, the challenge in any relationship, you know, different relationships work differently. Sometimes business gets a bit ahead. Uh, sometimes you are, you're kind of, uh, I would say, uh, socially, uh, or technologically driven. Uh, uh, when I look at the Quad, each one of the relationships has moved with a, with a different aspect of it uh, leading. Uh, uh, but I would say this uh, uh, for the political side, uh, I mean, with a degree of vested interest here, uh, that uh, we have actually led so far, uh, and uh, we have created an environment today where I think the business side, the economic side, the investment side, the technology side can come in uh, much more strongly. And that's really the phase uh, today that we need to be working at. So once again, really, thank you for your attention.